Caroline, do you want to start? Yeah, we made it. It's our yes. last papers we love of 2017. Woo. Yes. 24 talks later and half a thumb missing. Yeah, I used to have a ball. Now I don't have it anymore. There was an ordeal. I will tell you and I will show you my ugly scar if you want to after the meetup. She will show you. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's been a really, really great year for papers we love. Uh, we've done a lot of talks. Uh, and we got your feedback recently, so if we have you, a survey, yeah, we yeah. have a survey. If you haven't filled it out yet, we'll send it out again. Um, show of hands, if you filled it out. Ooh, oh, so two, yeah. Everyone has to fill yeah. it out. So Great. it's a Google form. We want to be able to make sure that for 2018, we bug the people that you want to see talk, and we give you the talks that you want to see, and then just like maybe if there are some improvements that you want us to make, we really want to hear from you. Yep. All right. Uh, anything else? We are lining up speakers for next year. We have things until March, but uh, we're missing some locations, and I need to sit down and actually announce them. But we have very interesting topics, very cool talks. So just please continue to come. And if you have, uh, if you work at a company that has a good uh, event space like this one with good AV and no NDAs um, at the door, please come chat with me at the break. Also, thank you to Wikia for hosting us. Thank you yes. to Wikia. Thank you to all of our sponsors. All right. Let's get started. So the way that this works is that we have two speakers. One is a mini speaker and the other one is a full length talk. And then we try to tell you something about the speakers uh, that it may be fake in their bio. So let's introduce to, let's introduce Kavya. Kavya writes code for a living at a startup in San Francisco. She particularly enjoys architecting and building highly concurrent and scalable systems. In her free time, she reads nonfiction and climbs rocks. Kavya has a bachelor's and master's in computer science from MIT. She is also an expert archer and was once able to open a watermelon with an arrow from 100 feet away. Let's give it up for Kavya. Hello, how are you all doing this evening? You have a microphone there. I don't think this one works very well. Yes, if you wanna walk. Yeah. Uh, Cool, so as Ines said, I'm Kavier, and I'm here today to sort of talk about this paper Kraken, but really the larger theme of the talk is uh, to talk about the performance analysis of systems. Now, um, why might we care about this? Well, ideally we want to give our users a good user experience, uh, so we care about things like uh, latency or response time, and ideally we also want to remain in business while doing so. So we care about things like server utilization and uh, capacity planning. Um, now this probably sounds familiar to a number of you. Um, how many people here have spent a lot of time and many a night trying to answer questions like this? What's the additional load the system can support? Uh, what are the utilization bottlenecks and how many additional servers do we need? Is our system over-provisioned? Any performance engineers in the house? All right. Um, maybe. Cool. <laughs> um, so this is obviously a very important set of questions to answer. And our question today is, well, how do we go about doing this? Now, this is not an easy set of questions to answer. Um, well, our systems are very complex. Uh, given we live in the age of microservices, this is more true now than ever. Uh, we live in an age of continuous deploy, so our systems are constantly under flux. The system you study and analyze today is no longer the same system tomorrow. And then, of course, there's the crux of the problem, right? Which is that our systems don't exactly behave intuitively, right? Um, for one, they, they scale non-linearly. Uh, that's the graph on the right. And the graph on the left um, tells us that our systems don't behave the same under stress, right? The, uh, the response time reacts non-linearly. Um, so yeah, how do we go about analyzing the performance of our systems? Uh, and today we're going to talk about one particular methodology, a particularly exciting methodology of using production. Uh, now this is not a new idea. We have seen and probably use variants of this like A-B testing and canaries and chaos engineering. Um, but the idea behind Kraken and what we'll talk about today is applying this methodology to performance analysis, right? The idea is you apply load to your production system, you gradually ramp up the, no the, the load and the stress on the system, um, 
uh, until it reaches its breaking point, more or less. Um, and you do this to empirically determine the system's behavior under stress, to empirically understand its performance characteristics, its bottleneck. Um, so this is what Kraken does. That's the, the paper and one of the systems we'll talk about. The other system I'd like to touch upon today is OrgSim, which is a load simulator that we built and uh, use at Samsara, where I work. Um, and finally, we'll take a step back uh, and leave with a parting thought about performance engineering. All right, so Kraken. Now, Kraken, how many people here actually read the paper? Okay, I did. <laughs> uh, so Kraken is Facebook's load simulator. Um, they built it in about 2013 and have used it in production since then. Um, and they use it primarily to determine a system's capacity, where capacity is the maximum throughput, so requests per second, a system can sustain subject to a given response time constraint, right? Um, and the system under test might be a single server, it can be a, an entire cluster, it can be an entire region, it doesn't matter. Um, now they use Kraken to identify and uh, resolve utilization bottlenecks. So you have a target capacity for your system and your system doesn't meet the capacity, so uh, why doesn't it do so? Um, and they claim in the paper that, they, that using Kraken allow them to increase Facebook's capacity by over 20% using the same hardware. Now, this is an impressive result, both for its engineering implement, uh, implications and just in terms of like dollars saved, right, for Facebook. Um, so the way Kraken works, first things first, um, the model uh, of system it's designed for. Uh, so Kraken assumes stateless servers. Um, so like an HTTP server, a simple HTTP server, for example, but no web sockets, um, no sticky sessions, nothing like this. Uh, it, the, the system, the assumption they also make is that the load to the system under test can be controlled by rerouting requests. Uh, and we'll see in a second why these two assumptions are necessary. And the third assumption they make is that downstream services respond to upstream service load shift. So for example, if you have a web server talking to a database um, and querying the database and the database um, becomes the bottleneck, it hits a resource utilization uh, limit, um, that is reflected in how the web, in the web server, right? And how the web server responds to requests. On the web server side, you'll see the response time go up, um, the throughput drop, things like this. Now this is a perfectly reasonable assumption. And again, this is necessary um, so you can actually use Kraken to identify bottlenecks, which is the entire goal. So that's the model. In terms of the design of the system, uh, there are two pieces to Kraken. The first piece is the load generation aspect. Um, and the idea here is uh, quite simple. Uh, you need a good representation of production workload and your best representation of production workload turns out to be production workload. So Kraken just uses live traffic um, and they use a familiar technique of traffic shifting. Uh, the idea is you um, change the weights on your load balancer. So basically you change the routing policy uh, to reroute a larger fraction of requests to your system under test. So for example, if you have a cluster of HTTP servers and you want to test a particular server, you just adjust the load balancer to send more requests to that one server, very simple. Um, the second piece to Kraken is monitoring. Um, now you need reliable metrics to track the health of the system, right? Both so uh, you know when the system is approaching its limits, those are the numbers you care about, um, and also to know when to back off. You don't want to cause a production outage while testing. Um, so they track, they use Gorilla, which is Facebook's time series database um, and monitoring system. Um, and they track a number of metrics uh, and they especially care about the response time, right? Because that uh, controls user experience. Okay, so um, Kraken basically employs the load generation and monitoring pieces in a feedback loop. So when you start a load test, uh, in one step, you reroute requests to the system on the test, you monitor it. If it's doing well, then in the next iteration, in the next step, you increase the fraction again and you keep bumping up that fraction of requests, um, the load on the system uh, until 
the monitoring system tells you to back off, and this is nice and automatic in the case of Kraken. All right, um, so that's like the first half of the paper. But to me personally, the second half of the paper, which is the evaluation, is more interesting. So now let's talk about that. Um, so say you take Kraken and you run it against uh, your system on the test. Say it's a cluster, so your HTTP server cluster, your web servers, um, and you get a graph that looks like this. Now, is this graph useful? Well, sure. It tells us um, it tells us the capacity of this cluster, right? Um, which is the maximum throughput uh, the cluster can sustain. Given, the, given our set response time threshold. We don't want our response time to exceed that horizontal line. So that's good. We now know the capacity of our system. But is this number good or bad? Is there a bottleneck we should try and fix? And, you know, I don't know. We have no means to evaluate the system because we haven't set any targets. We haven't set any expectations for how we expect the system to behave. And, and like in your relationship, you no know, expectations is not a good thing in performance analysis. Uh, so, um, so to fix that problem, we're going to hop over to performance modeling land. Performance modeling speaks to this idea of taking a real world system, uh, representing it using a theoretical model, analyzing the theoretical model to get results, and applying that to your um, actual system. And we're going to use performance modeling to determine a, a, a target cluster capacity, right? Uh, and we're going to do this in two steps. The first step is determining the capacity of a single server in our cluster. Now, we're going to model the web server as a queuing system. And if you think about this, this is like, it makes sense. It's perfectly reasonable to do. Um, requests come into the web server. And if the server is busy serving other requests, they're going to queue. Now, in queuing theory, the total response time is the time a request spends in the queue, so the queuing delay. Um, so that plus the time it actually takes to serve the request, the service time. Now, queuing theory makes one important assumption, um, which is that we're going to assume that there is no upstream saturation. So the network, the database, the backend services, they're not going to saturate. They're not going to become the bottleneck. Um, and this is, a, this is a standard assumption made while analyzing uh, single server systems in isolation. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to treat the service time as a constant, right? And then we can say that the response time is directly proportional to the queuing delay. Now we're going to apply um, um, a neat result from performance theory called uh, the utilization law, which says that the utilization or the busyness of the server is the product of the throughput and the service time. And since we said the service time is constant, what this means is when throughput increases, the busyness, the utilization of the server increases. Um, now for this next piece, I'm not going to show any math, and, but it's perfectly intuitive. Um, when the busyness of the server increases and there's an incoming request, the probability that the request has to queue increases, um, which means that the average queue length increases, um, and, so the, and so the average queuing delay increases and therefore the response time increases, right? Now this last, this last, the, that last relation is nonlinear. And so we, this is what gives us the, the much dreaded response time throughput hockey stick graph. Uh, cool. So Kraken uses this insight to very precisely measure um, the capacity of a single server, right? They load test a single server in isolation. So they gradually ramp up the load and they monitor the queuing delay. And they set a threshold. So when the queuing delay uh, exceeds their set threshold, that throughput at that point gives them the capacity uh, for a single server. Great. So at this point, we have the capacity of a single server. Uh, from this, can we derive the capacity of our cluster of n servers? Sure. If we assume perfectly linear scaling, 
Um, so cluster capacity would simply be the single server's capacity times n. But the only problem is our systems don't scale linearly, right? This is a graph that we're probably familiar with. Um, and the reason they don't scale linearly, the, the universal scalability law, another um, performance theory uh, result tells us, comes down to two reasons, right? Systems scale sublinearly sub because of contention, because there's a contention, contention penalty. So as the number of servers increases, they, there is contention for shared resources. Um, and this means there's more queuing. And the second penalty comes in the form of a consistency penalty. So again, as the number of servers increases, uh, if your servers have to coordinate with one another, there's a penalty for that as well. So why do we care about this? Well, this tells us that the target capacity, the target cluster capacity we set must be close to, but less than that theoretical maximum capacity. Right. So in Facebook's case, they set their target capacity to be 93% of the theoretical theoretical maximum. Now this is impressively aggressive. Um, so going back to our question, um, we ran our load test against the system and we got a graph that looks like this. And our question is, is there a problem we need to go fix or is this good enough? Well, if we were to plot the theoretical capacity on the same graph and took the difference between those two values, we see that the, that the, that the value we got is 90% of the theoretical max, not 93%. So in Facebook's case, this means, yes, there's a bottleneck that they're going to go and fix. So great, so there's a bottleneck. Where do we find these bottlenecks? Again, the universal scalability law tells us where to look. It tells us to look for sources of contention and um, coordination. Um, so Facebook does this. And in the paper, they have an entire section, all these fascinating bottlenecks they uncover. Um, my personal favorite is the first, and it's worth reading the paper just for this section. Um, so all right, so that's Kraken. And uh, at this point, we've seen that Kraken is a system. and is this like load testing system that's um, that's brought that's brought both like success and profit to Facebook? So can we have a two? Uh, and the answer is yes, you can. Uh, there are a number of op open source tools like Apache JMeter, um, which are open source load testers, load simulators, or you could go build your own, which is exactly what we did at Samsara. Uh, we built a tool called that we call OrgSim. Now, tools like OrgSim and Apache JMeter and whatever you have, uh, they obviously work very differently than Kraken. Um, the first difference is in the load generation aspect, right? So the way these uh, tools work is they run a configurable number of virtual clients, so you can specify how many clients you want to run. And each client basically issues a request to your production system in a loop. And this can be a busy loop. Uh, this can be a loop with a configurable delay, depending on the tool you're using. And um, obviously, these tools all use a synthetic workload, right? Uh, in the case of Samsara, what we do is we look at um, historical data to generate a profile. Uh, and we feed that profile into our simulator. Uh, and that's how it generates load. The second difference is in the monitoring component. It's external to the load testing system. Right, so unfortunately, we don't have a nice like automatic feedback loop like Kraken does. Uh, we we manually monitor our systems and back off when needed. Okay, so we've found OrgSim and uh, tools like Apache JMeter to be incredibly valuable. But rather than talking about the results that we've um, the results we've seen, I'd like to talk about a couple of gotchas while using these tools if you choose to use them. Uh, the first, of course, is that the workload is synthetic. So it might not be an actual, uh, an accurate representation of your actual workload. We actually ran into this problem where we generated a profile and forgot to regenerate a profile several months later. And obviously, uh, our workload had changed significantly. Um, and the second gotcha is a little, uh, is a little more nuanced. 
Uh, so say you take your load simulator and you run a load test against your system, uh, increasing the number of virtual clients, right? So you run one virtual client and then 10, 20, 30, all the way up to 100, and you get a graph that looks like this, a response time graph that looks like this. Does this tell us anything interesting about our system? <laughs> well, it tells us that the load test is broken. It's broken because the load, because the response time graph, we know from performance theory, uh, we know that the response time graph should be a hockey stick, right? So our curve has the wrong shape. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that in this case, um, the load simulators hit a bottleneck, right? So for example, you're running the load simulator itself on an EC2 instance and uh, you max out the CPU. So you think you're running 100 virtual clients, but in reality, only 60 of them are actually running. So when you use a load simulator uh, or a tool like this, um, how can we ensure that we're getting accurate results? And to answer that question, we turn to performance theory again. And uh, there's a, a, neat a neat result called Little's Law. It's that formula which tells us that the concurrency is the throughput times the response time. Now we're measuring the throughput and the response time. Um, and so we get the theoretical concurrency and we can match that up with the number of virtual clients we think we're actually running. Okay, so that's Kraken and that's org sim. Um, the theme I want to leave you with is this. Um, first, Empiricism is queen, right? Uh, performance theory, so things like queuing theory and the universal scalability law are powerful, but they make assumptions, they're models, so they have limitations, um, and nothing speaks the truth like cold, hard, empirical data. That said, um, your data is no good without uh, a rigorous framework in which to evaluate it, and that is the case for performance modeling and performance theory. So um, should you be performance testing or performance modeling? And the answer as the Kraken paper shows us is both. You should always be doing both uh, because that's, that's where you derive your most powerful and insightful results. Thank you. All right, let's like this is our last talk of the year. Woo, 2017. All right, everybody, I will introduce you to Matt. Matt builds tools and infrastructure for quantitative research at Two Sigma. He previously worked at Microsoft on Visio, focusing on ways to connect data to shapes. In his spare time, he builds ergonomic keyboards using Clojure. Matt's favorite show growing up was Julia Child's The French Chef, and his churn butter was considered a family jewel. Let's give it up for Matt. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Inez and Elaine, for running this. It's awesome, great year. Um, I'm more of a Graham Care person than a Julia Childs, but I don't know if anybody knows the, the cooking <laughs> world. Um, all right, so today I'm going to be talking about modern distributed optimization. Um, so this is about optimizing things in a distributed fashion, not necessarily about optimizing distributed systems. Uh, so it's not about like where to put a cache or um, how to eliminate bottlenecks, but these techniques can actually be used for that purpose. And I'll show some examples of that. Um, I work at Two Sigma Investments. We are in a regulated industry, so I have to give you this important legal information. I'm not <laughs> soliciting investments or making any uh, investment advice, so know that. No comment on Bitcoin. Um, all right, so what types of optimization problems am I talking about? I'm talking about problems that are best represented by this emoji, which is my favorite emoji. You have to dig kind of deep into the keyboard to find it, but it's there. Um, and it's this problem where you have a bunch of knobs and they affect the performance of your system. And they could affect it in all sorts of different ways that you don't necessarily understand um, 
and you want to find the best setting of these knobs for some measurement. Uh, it could be throughput and latency, it could be reducing costs, it could be anything. Um, the category though is cases where you don't know how these knobs relate. You don't have a nice mathematical formula. Um, and so it's an unknown function. You can't do things like gradient descent or any of the neat tricks that we can do when we have math. Um, so we have an unknown function with multiple parameters and the function is expensive to evaluate. And it could be expensive either in terms of time to evaluate it or cost or often both. Um, so we're gonna look at techniques for doing this. So just general optimization. And uh, this is a very well-studied problem. You can tell because we can write it in math. Um, every single paper in this space starts with this. And basically we have our function f that we want to either minimize or maximize. Uh, it takes some parameter x, this could be a vector, so it could have like multiple values in it. And there's this space of possible values. And we wanna find the value in this space that either minimizes or maximizes our function. We usually just write minimization and maximization is just multiplying your function by negative one. So th they're really the same thing. So that's the mathy way of saying it. And maybe you're thinking, I don't do math. This isn't relevant to me, but you're wrong. And I will show you lots of examples of how it is relevant to you. So the structure of this talk is, uh, we're gonna look at some real world problems and then do deep dive into a few different algorithms for doing this and then talk about how to apply this stuff now. Uh, there are papers sprinkled throughout, which is why this is papers we love. Um, so it was perfect that the, we had the preceding talk because it was very relevant to all of this. Um, so let's look at some real world problems. The first one is cluster configuration. So we've got our distributed system and we want to figure out what it should look like, what the architecture of it should be, how many machines should we have, what should the specs of those machines be, uh, what should, how should our network be configured. Um, we have all of these different configuration parameters um, and they all affect the overall performance of our system and the overall cost of our system, right? If you're running on AWS, you really care about how many machines you, are, you have because you can scale elastically, but with that uh, capability comes the opportunity to spend a lot of money by accident. We don't want to do that. So how do we configure our clusters? Well, earlier this year, there was actually a paper called Cherry Pick uh, that was a collaboration by a bunch of folks, uh, Yale, Microsoft, Alibaba, uh, University of California, Berkeley, right around the corner. This was actually out of the AMP Lab, which is the place that makes a lot of the things that you run uh, your distributed system with or on your distributed system like Apache Mesos and Apache Spark. Um, and what they did in this paper was they wanted to tune their Spark clusters. They wanted to find the best settings that maximized throughput, minimized latency while maintaining a reasonable cost. And the way that they did this was by applying a technique called Bayesian optimization. And what's really cool about it is they were able to find uh, optimal or near, near optimal configurations by just running um, 12 to 15 iterations. So they have this space with thousands of possible configurations. They only needed to evaluate about 12 points before finding something that was near optimal. And uh, in this case, the optimal solution was uh, about two to three times better than the average solution in that space. And I believe it was 12, yeah, 12 times better than the worst case solution in that space. So Bayesian optimization is cool. Um, another problem that is real and is near and dear to my heart is JVM tuning. So here I'm running uh, Java, asking it to print out its, uh, the VM options. And you can see we make it about halfway through the A's. Um, <laughs> so there are a lot of options for the JVM. And um, prove it, we've got 823 on, on 1.8. Um, and many of these do not matter. Many of these options don't matter, but a lot of them do, and they will affect the performance of your system. Um, 
some of the biggest impact will come from uh, garbage collection and how you've set up your heap sizes and, and the various parameters for that. So the question is, what setting should you run? It's the solution that most people go with is this one. Uh, this is <laughs> Sophie, a, a friend of mine. Um, so basically, we run our system with some settings, and as soon as it starts to crap out, we bump up whatever settings we think are going to help. If they did help, we just use those forever until it craps out again. Does anybody here do this? Is this? Yes. So I've, I've seen this happen at scale, um, and it's a disaster, and you can waste a lot. So uh, one of the coolest solutions to this um, is something that's been coming out of Twitter. They've been talking about this recently. They, they uh, actually just presented it also at QCon SF, I think, a month ago, um, where with they are doing is they have hundreds of thousands of JVM processes uh, running across tens of thousands of machines, um, lots of different, it's a heterogeneous set of processes running on a heterogeneous set of machines, uh, and they want to tune them all. What they do is they have a service that does Bayesian optimization of those things. Um, it tests out the settings, sees what the resulting throughput and latency is, um, and they're doing this continuously because they actually found that the best settings are ephemeral. Uh, they're changing constantly. So uh, on a regular basis, they are testing out new things. And this is very relevant um, to the talk that we just saw because they, they find that empiricism is the, is, it, is, was, is it the queen? Is that it? Yeah, empiricism is the queen. Um, so they have posted a bunch of numbers. Um, I think the most impressive one was what they found with their Hadoop clusters. They were able to reduce the cost by 80%. Um, this was a great talk. I, I highly recommend it. Um, and again, Bayesian optimization. There's a theme. Um, all right. So we've seen a couple system solution, systems problems that I suspect a lot of people in here have encountered. Um, but there are also real world business problems that can be solved with these techniques. Uh, Yelp is a great example of doing this. They've been very open about how they've applied this to their A-B testing framework. Um, we run A-B tests because we want to see which thing is better, but how do we know which tests to even run, how long to run them for? These tests are expensive because they're actually requiring humans to interact with them, and it could take days or even weeks to get back a result for how, how good um, a setting was. So they are using Bayesian optimization to uh, decide their test. Um, and they were kind enough to actually open source the system that they were using for doing this. It's called Mo, the uh, metrics, metric optimization engine. Um, it's, Bayesian, it's a Bayesian optimization service. Uh, the person who did this, uh, Dr. Scott Clark, um, has uh, continue to do other things in here and publish a lot, and I'll talk about some of the work uh, that he's done. Um, and then finally, I have to talk about deep learning. It's kind of cool. Um, I assume everybody's been hit over the head with it a lot, um, but it is an optimization problem, right? You set up this, just in case anybody doesn't know, um, you have this network of functions and you've got your inputs, they have weights associated with them, they output to the next layer of functions, um, and so on. And the, the big problem is figuring out what the weights should be here. Sorry for not, that wasn't clear, but it's an optimization function. You wanna figure out what weights to use. This is not an optimization function that you use Bayesian optimization for. Um, this, is, when we pick these functions, we pick simple mathematical things that have derivatives that we can apply things like uh, the technique called gradient descent to, to find the optimal weights. Um, but there are these things called hyperparameters. So uh, this is the TensorFlow Playground. It's a, sorry if you can't see that. It's a, um, it's a website. They've implemented all this deep learning stuff in JavaScript, so you don't have to, so you can just start playing with it right away. And configure, uh, train up a, a neural net to recognize some data, 
Um, the reason that I'm showing you this is because there are actually lots and lots of settings here. There are, I think, about 24 different parameters that you that the human has to choose before even training up the network. So you have things like the learning rate and which activation functions to use and how many layers there should be in your network, how many nodes there should be in the network. There are all these decisions that uh, don't have clear mathematical relationships to the quality of your output. And there you want to use these, these black box optimization functions um, for hyperparameter tuning. And this is not just applicable to deep learning, pretty much every machine learning technique has some hyperparameters that you need to tune um, and you want to use these techniques. A lot of people are using this thing called Bayesian optimization, um, including Google. So Google has this service uh, as part of their cloud machine learning engine called HyperTune, which uh, does black box optimization of your hyperparameters, um, primarily using Bayesian optimization, but they support other things. And um, it's done by this separate service called Google Vizier, which they uh, released a paper about just a couple months ago, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. But right now I'm just framing the real world problems. Um, in that paper, one of the real world problems that they talk about, um, which I don't have a slide for, but I'll just go over to the paper. Um, so their use cases, hyperparameter tuning and hypertune, which we just talked about, automatic AB, automated AB testing, which Yelp is also doing, and uh, delicious chocolate chip cookies. Um, I don't know how I feel about this one, but they uh, were using these algorithms to tune the recipes for chocolate chip cookies, and every week they would give a different recipe to their contractors responsible for providing desserts, and then they would do surveys of the people who ate the cookies and then um, try to find the optimal cookie recipe. Um, and apparently they ended up being delicious. They, they have that in the conclusion. <laughs> it designs excellent cookies, which is a very rare capability among computational systems. <laughs> All right. So, hopefully some of those problems resonate with you, whether you're on the systems design side or you're trying to solve business problems or you're in the machine learning world, you need to do black box optimization. So, I'm going to look at some algorithms for doing it. Um, so what, what are the types of algorithms that we use for this? Well, I would say probably 99% of the time, we have the human as the function, as the optimization function. So we encounter these things all the time. What do most of us do? We guess and check, right? You have some idea for what possible values there are. Try them out. You try out some other ones. You see what works. That's it. Maybe you think you're smart, or maybe you are smart. Um, and you have a model of your system in your head and you kind of can intuit what good settings would be, um, you're probably wrong, but those are, those are kind of the, the human class of things. There's guess and check, and there's your mental model. But a lot of us are programmers, know how to use computers, so we try to use a computer to do this, right? Um, the obvious thing to do is to write a bunch of for loops, right? Nested for loops. Searching over your space, um, you have your, some dimension, you can divvy it up and kind of create a grid, and this is called grid search. So the problem with this is that it is very, very expensive, right? If you divide each dimension up into n points, you're going to end up with n to the d points. It's very, it doesn't scale with the number of dimensions. Um, and it's actually not going to be as good as just randomly evaluating points, but that's another story. Um, maybe, again, you think you're smart and you say, all right, instead of looking over the whole grid, I'm just going to optimize one dimension. I'm going to fix all the other ones at some values, go over a bunch of values for this one dimension, find the best one there, move on to the next dimension, and just do this for each dimension. Um, that's called coordinate descent. And a lot of us do that. I, I've done it. Um, it doesn't really work. It only works if you have a very well-behaved function um, that has some nice convexity prop, uh, properties and um, don't do that. So what do we want? What we want is we want magic, right? We want to be able, we have 
some function we don't know anything about. We want to be able to evaluate points intelligently, learn from the results of those points, figure out what the, the best next thing to evaluate is. Um, and that's the class of algorithms that we're going to look at now. So there is a whole world of them, and I cannot cover even a, a small fraction of them. Um, so I'm just going to talk about two. Uh, I'm going to talk about the first one and the most recent one, or at least the most successful one. So the one of the, the first big successes in this was what's called the simplex method. This is probably not the simplex. If you've heard of, if you've learned about the simplex method, you probably did not learn this. You probably learned something else that's called the simplex method, which also exists in the world of optimization, but it's not related to this, unfortunately named. Um, a lot of people just call this Nelder Mead, um, named after the two authors. So this is from 1965. It's over 50 years old, um, and it is still one of the most popular algorithms um, for doing optimization. Uh, in R, the optim function defaults to using this algorithm. It's also the mo one of the most cited papers in computer science. It's been cited over 24,000 times um, because optimiz optimization comes up everywhere. So they just get all these citations for free. So what is the, the uh, Nelder Mead method? Well, it starts with a simplex. So what is a simplex? Simplex is just a fancy way of saying triangle. Okay. Um, more specifically, if you have d dimensions, it's d plus one points uh, in in that space. So if you have one dimension, it's a line segment. If you have two dimensions, it's a triangle. If you have three dimensions, it's a tetrahedron or a pyramid. Um, and I don't know the names beyond that. But um, what you do is, let's say we have two two parameters for our function, our unknown function. What we're going to do is we're going to pick a triangle of points. And we're going to pick three points that define a triangle. Um, and then we're going to have some update that moves that triangle around. And I'll explain how that works now. But first, I will show you the picture or the animation of how that triangle moves. So here we've got a function, uh, a two-dimensional function. This is a heat map. I don't know why it doesn't have colors. It was free on Wiki Wikipedia. So I'm not going to complain, but it's trying to minimize or maximize, I don't know, um, this function. And you can see that you have this triangle, this simplex, that kind of flops around and eventually converges on an optimal point. So how does this work? I'm just going to walk through it step by step. We've, we pick three points, it could be any three points, uh, and we evaluate the function at those three points. And then what we do is we see which of those three points was the worst. Let's say it was this one without loss of generality. So the first thing that we do is we, we say, all right, we've got these two points here. And on this side of the point, there's badness. So let's try looking on the other side. And we do what's called a reflection. So we just reflect that bad point of about the center of the other two points, and we evaluate our function there. Now, there are a few possibilities for this new point. We evaluate our function there, and it's either better than those other two points, worse than those other two points, or in between those other two points. So let's say it's better than those two points. So we've got this new best point. The idea is that we moved from that red one to the green one, and things got good. So let's just keep going in that direction. And we do what's called an expand. So we just double the distance that we moved um, from the center. And we try out this new point. That's this stretched out triangle. If this one is, is even better, we say, all right, this new stretched out triangle is our new, our new simplex. Let's restart the algorithm using that one. Um, if it's not better, we just use the green point. Um, if it's in between, if the green point, if the new point was in between the other two, um, in terms of goodness, we just use that, that triangle uh, as our new simplex and recurse. And the other case is that it's worse than, it's the worst of those uh, points. So what we're seeing here is as we move further away from those white points, things get bad. So we just do a contract and we just get closer to them. So we had three things that we did. I'm sorry if that got a little muddled, but we either do, we do a reflect, an expand, and a contract. Those are our three possible operations. And then we recurse using this new triangle. So again, when that's in action, the triangle just moves around like this remarkably effective. Um, 
and also incredibly easy to compute. So 1965, there was not a lot of uh, computation power. All that this does is addition, subtraction, and a little bit of multiplication. There's no division, there's no calculus. It just, and, and you don't need to know anything about your function, and it usually works. The problem is that it's a serial algorithm. Each time we evaluated one point to figure out what the next point was. And we have lots of computers, we have lots of cores in our machines, we want to take advantage of those. So how can we distribute this algorithm? Well, there are a couple ways of doing it. One is multi-start. And this is a technique that can be applied to a lot of different uh, optimization algorithms, where all that we do, we have n machines, we just have n starting simplexes or simplices, and we just let the algorithm run in parallel on each of them. And um, so we've got different color simplexes for the different machines. And this works. This can take advantage of the additional processing power that we have. And um, one of the weaknesses with Nelder Mead is that it can get stuck in local optima. Um, this reduces the likelihood that we that we got that our that the one starting simplex that we had uh, gets stuck in a local optima because um, we have lots of different starting points. So that's good. Um, there was this really clever paper in 1990, um, which was, I think, the first case of somebody trying to parallelize these algorithms. Um, and there are some real gems in this paper where they talk about how any day now we're going to have thousands of cores on each machine and we need to be ready for this. So um, let's figure out the algorithms. And what they do is a trick that's common for um, trying to parallelize things, which is they apply speculation. So we had that. Um, that initial simplex, and we had three possibilities for what might happen. We might do a reflect, we might do an expand after that, we might do a contract. Let's just try them all. Um, and not only try all of those, but for each of those possibilities, there are three resulting possibilities um, that we might do after that. And we can just kind of go deep and come up with a full plan for what are the next like three or nine or 27 points that we would evaluate if we had enough machines. Um, and you end up with pretty pictures that look like this that define a speculative plan. Um, speculation is something that gets used in lots of algorithms. Basically, wherever you have an if statement, you can parallelize by just evaluating both possibilities and just be optimistic. So that works. Um, it scales to a huge number of machines, but there is, oh, and, and it gives better results even when done serially, which is really cool. Um, but it has a, a problem, which is that you have a batch. You have to wait for all, all of the points to be evaluated um, before you figure out what the next set of points you're going to evaluate are. So we have these two options. We could do the speculative approach, where we have a single large batch, and all results uh, influence the next batch. Or we can have multi-start, where it's completely asynchronous, but the local results only influence the local next steps. There's no sharing of information. Um, and this isn't, what we really want is something that is asynchronous and has sharing of results. So as the different workers figure things out, we want uh, each of them to be able to communicate that with each other and influence each other. So um, I don't know if there's a way of doing it with Nelder Mead, but there is a way of doing that with Bayesian optimization. So going to shift gears. Sorry if got, that got a little muddled, um, but this will be, be better. <laughs> um, so Bayesian optimization. You know that this is good because it has the word Bayesian in it. Um, and your prior tells you that anything with Bayesian in the title is good. Um, or you read Nate Silver. Um, so Bayesian optimization is really cool. And it I could describe it very simply, but it gets very hairy. So we estimate the underlying function. We make a guess for what the, the function is. And then we evaluate the point that we think is going to be the optimum of that, of that guess for the function. And then we update our estimate. And we just do this in a loop. So that sounds simple, but um, it's not really clear how you do this. So I'm going to walk through an example. So here's the function that we want to optimize. I'm, I'm cheating by telling you what the actual function is. Um, we want to find the maximum of this function. So what we're going to do is we're going to guess a point, 
and we're gonna evaluate the function there. So does anybody have an idea for what the first point we should evaluate is? Zero is as good a guess as any. Um, yeah, you could, be, you could do it randomly. Um, there, there is a, a whole field of study around experimental design that, that like comes up with good initial plans, but I'm just gonna start at zero. Um, all right, so I evaluate my function. We, this is a, a one-dimensional function. So the bottom here is our parameter, and then the y-axis is the, um, the value of the function. All right, so I evaluated it here. So now I need to guess what the function is. <laughs> so I've got one point, and I don't know anything. It could be anything, as long as it goes through that point. Um, any squiggly line that you can imagine um, is a possibility for the function. But what we're gonna do is, instead of coming up with one guess for what the function is, we're gonna come up with a family of possible functions um, that it could be. And the only restriction is that every point in that family has to, every function in that family has to go through this one point. And the way that we're gonna describe that family of functions is with what's called a Gaussian process. And that's not a great name. Um, all it is is it's a function where instead at each point, instead of giving us back uh, a single value, it gives us back a distribution. It gives us back a Gaussian distribution. So for every function, every point, um, instead of getting a single value, we're gonna get a mean and a standard deviation. And the idea is that as we get closer to this point, the standard deviation is going to shrink down um, because we're kind of, we kind of assume that the closer we get to that point, the closer the, the, the function's value is gonna to be to that point. And we get something that looks like this, all right? So at each point, can you see that there are three different shades there? Yes. All right. So um, I'm showing the one plus or minus one standard deviation, plus or minus two standard deviations, plus or minus three standard deviations. So as we get further away, we have less confidence in what the value of the function is. But as we get closer to this point, we're more and more confident that the, the function is going to be close to that point. And then what we do is we want to figure out what's the next point to evaluate. So we have this other thing called an acquisition function, which um, the way that we can, there are a bunch of different acquis possible acquisition functions. What I'm doing in this one is I take my one known point, I take my best point that I've seen, and I look across the space and I see what's the probability that the result is gonna be greater than the max that I've ever seen. So, um, I'll, add, I'll, I'll do one iteration, then maybe this will be clearer. So right now, my best guess is gonna be near the ends. Um, that's where we're maximizing the likelihood that we find something greater than, than our point. We update our acquisition function, um, and we're kind of, it's kind of like a ponytail where we're adding in these rubber bands that kind of collapse down our possible guesses to the points that we observe. So we now know the value out here. We know this point. Sorry, that's really not visible. Um, and that point was worse than this point. And you can see that our guess for the acquisition function now is um, much lower over here. We're, we don't think that this is a good place to look. We probably think that somewhere over here is a good place to look. So we're gonna evaluate the next point and we keep doing this each time. Um, updating our acquisition function and picking the point that we think is going to be, it maximizes the likelihood that we find something better. Now, what this does is it, it has this um, explore versus exploit trade-off. So a lot of the black box optimization functions kind of switch between these modes where at first they like explore the space and then once they find something promising, they really drill into it. So if you're familiar with simulated annealing, that's like the basic idea is that you start off really hot, you can look anywhere, and then as it cools down, you, you move around less and you, you kind of hone in. The cool thing with Bayesian optimization is it always maintains the option of uh, looking, of, ex of switching modes, of switching back to explore um, or, and switching out of exploit. So right now it's kind of in this exploit mode where it really thinks that there's something good over here. The, the area, the darkness, 
looks much better on my screen. Um, the amount of darkness um, up over this point is kind of maximized right here. So it really drilled into that. And then now we're at this point where it's no longer finding something juicy. So it's saying, all right, I'm going to look probably either over here or over here. Um, and with just a few evaluations, it's got a pretty good sense for what the underlying function looked like. And it didn't really waste much time out here. Um, it didn't waste much time evaluating points out there to learn that there isn't much promising stuff out there. Now, eventually, if I let this run long enough, it will fill in a lot more of the space. But um, it's really focused on this, on this goodness here. So does this make sense? Please, if there are any questions. Okay, so when I was saying explore versus exploit, I'm talking about um, where to look in the space. So, like in that recent case, let me restart this and give a. So, when I'm saying exploit, I'm saying it's like looking. Exploit to me means that it's looking near the best point that it's found so far, and explore means looking far away from the point, best point that it's found so far. So um, this point over here, when it eventually decides to look over there, to me, that's an explore. Um, because it's making a decision to look far away from the best that it's, current, that it's ever seen. Now, um, a few notes about Bayesian optimization. So one is there are a lot of hyperparameters to Bayesian optimization. There, you have to pick a kernel, you have to pick all these different um, parameters, and that in itself is an optimization problem. On top of that, to find the max of, an of the acquisition function, we have to do some optimization. And that can actually require applying some of those other algorithms like Nelder Mead. Um, and it's just optimization problems all the way down. All right. No. It is not continuous functions only. Um, a lot of the proofs that this stuff works assumes that you have certain types of continuity or um, uh, you, it, there's this very weak continuity assumption that a lot of them make that it has uh, what's called Lipschitz continuity. But, um, but, but in practice, it actually works really well even if you don't have continuity. Um, it's just not always provable. All right. Anybody follow like half of that? Can I just see some hands? All right. Yeah, so you might be able to, to get um, get away with some proofs with weaker assumptions. Some things might require more. In practice, we don't really. We just try it and hope that it works. All right, so that's Bayesian optimization in a nutshell. Um, that was the demo. Um, so one thing that, and I'm not going to get too into this, I'm just going to let you know that it, ha that it works. Um, there, you can parallelize this algorithm. And one thing that's really cool is that you can pick, uh, in this case, we pick Q points that we're going to evaluate. Um, and we pick them such that they maximize the likelihood of finding a better point among the Q of them. Um, so it kind of will pick some spread out points to search for. And what's cool is that when one of them completes, when, once you, let's say you send them out to a bunch of different um, workers and one of them completes, you can then solve for what the next point you should evaluate is given what you know about the function and what you have pending, um, what the Q minus one pending evaluations are. So um, 
this allows us to take advantage of what we know um, while being asynchronous. Very cool. There's a paper about it. Um, this parallel Bayesian global optimization of expensive functions. Uh, Scott Clark, who was the person who I mentioned earlier uh, from Yelp, is one of the authors of that. All right. And then just some advanced cool things. Um, these are some pretty pictures, but the one thing is this freeze thaw algorithm. And these are not the names of two people, um, freeze and thaw. It's actually about freezing and thawing. Um, so the question is, what if you can approximate your objective function early? So um, our objective function is expensive to compute. Let's say we're doing some deep learning thing where each time we want to evaluate a hyperparameter, we need to train up this neural net. It can take a long time. Um, what if along the way of training it, we realize this is a crappy point? Like, like it's just not going to pan out as being the best. Um, can we give up early and still get some good results? And the answer is yes. And what you do is instead of collapsing that uh, Gaussian pro process down to a single point, you, you don't collapse it all the way. You collapse it such that you're able to still reflect um, the uncertainty that you have because you didn't finish evaluating the point. Um, and later on, you may decide, actually, you know what, I do want to look there and kind of resume the computation if you were able to freeze it. Um, and that's the, the freeze thaw. So this is one potential uh, optimization. Uh, and then there are a bunch of people who are trying to make this into a service. So the two biggies right now are Google and this company Sigopt. Um, there, there used to be a third, but they got acquired by um, Twitter and then all left and went to Google. So <laughs> it's um, basically these are the two, two big players in um, black box optimization as a service. So Google Vizier is being made available uh, via their Google's machine learning engine um, and called Hypertune. Um, and Sigopt is a generalized service that uh, is a, it's a SaaS thing, um, but they also are making, um, making it easy to use from AWS. And um, the Google Vizier paper, I, not quite sure, but it seems like they have it, that it's pluggable which algorithm they use. So they have Bayesian optimization, but they also let you use a bunch of other things. Sigopt is taking a different approach, uh, which is they are using um, an ensemble of different techniques and dynamically figuring out which technique is best for your problem um, and getting very good results with that. So Sigopt one is at, like as plug and play as it gets. You don't have to specify any hyperparameters. You just you, it's, a, it's a REST service. You post to them a description of what your parameters are. Like, I have three parameters. This one's real from zero to one. This one's a real from zero to one. And this one's uh, categorical with five possible values. They respond back with a set of points that you should evaluate. You post back to them what the objective function result was for that. So they don't know what your objective function is. They don't do any computation. They just find out what the value is from you. Um, and then they respond back with the next set of points to evaluate. And it's just a simple for loop that you write. Um, and behind the scenes, they have crazy computation going on, um, doing Bayesian optimization and other optimization techniques. Um, and it works pretty well. So you can apply these now by using those two things. Um, there are also plenty of packages that do Bayesian optimization, uh, mostly in Python, because everybody uses Python now. Um, Spearmint and GPyopt are two biggies. Uh, there's one called Boat, which was uh, written up in uh, Adrian Coiler's daily paper blog, if anybody's familiar with that, um, which is pretty cool. What they do is, um, they, it's not just Gaussian process. They let you model what your system is. Um, like, let's say you have some idea uh, on how your system behaves. You can specify a model, and they will use that instead of a Gaussian process. There are these generalized services like Mo and Sigopt and Google um, Vizier. And then there's an open source version of Vizier called Advisor, where somebody's trying to just replicate what was in the paper. Uh, and they have about half of the algorithms implemented there. And then finally, there are specialized services. Um, there's this one called Skipjack, which Adrian Coiler also wrote about, um, where it's Bayesian optimization 
specifically on AWS for tuning your JVM parameters. So if you want some of that Twitter magic, um, there is a startup that is just doing that for you now. Um, you just point them at your server and they will tune your JVM for you. So um, that is modern Bayesian optimization, bunch of papers there. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs>